So uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, to this breakout room on uh, data sharing for improved the situational awareness. So I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for making themselves available to be here today, and also to everyone who has joined the the panel to learn more about this topic. Uh, just before we get started, uh, just make sure you are on the right breakout uh, room. At the bottom of the live stream, you have the three options uh, for different breakout rooms. This is breakout uh, room uh, one. So if uh, we were planning to attend other sessions, just make uh, sure you uh, choose the, um, the, the, the right one. So with no further ado, so let's get uh, started uh, today. So here, uh, but to start, my name is Paula Barbosa. Um, I'm Associate Director of Vaccines Policy at the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations, and I'll be moderating this um, this, this panel today. Uh, with us, uh, we have today uh, Rob Hanfield, Executive Director of Supply Chain Resource Cooperative and Professor of Supply Chain Management of North Carolina State uh, University. We also have uh, Rasmus uh, Hansen, uh, CEO of uh, Affinity, uh, and uh, Julie Swan from the department, department head of the FITS Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering uh, of North Carolina State, State um, mm -hmm. University. So to get started on this topic, uh, um, I would like to ask each of the um, of the the panelists to give a, a based on their personal experience uh, over the last uh, few months uh, to let us know what is, they saw as uh, main challenges uh, facing um, facing the, the, the uh, during this pandemic in terms of um, awareness of. Uh, of the of the current situation from supply chain distribution and so on. So, from your perspective, personal experience, uh, what what you think were the main uh, the main challenges that uh, we faced? Uh, can start uh, with uh, Rob. Well, thank you, Paula. It's a it's a pleasure to be here today. And um, there certainly have been many many challenges as we think about um, you know the last the last year and and going into. Uh, you know, this, the second half of 2021 uh, future challenges as well. Um, I, I think the primary challenges have been, uh, you know, several fold. One is, one is the lack of visibility into uh, these extended supply chains. And, um, you know, what we've seen is governments created a lot of funding for manufacturing of vaccines, certainly at, uh, uh, at, at you know, the, um, the, the contract manufacturing level. Um, but then when we started to go further upstream, uh, we, it became clear that there were a lot of uh, shortages that were occurring for some of the key supply chain inputs, um, bioreactor bags, uh, filters, single use technologies are, are, are some of those. And um, uh, secondly, that the distribution of uh, vaccines has also fallen short, uh, especially around some of the Lower, lower income, medium income countries that have vaccination rates that are that are very low, and uh, to make it worse, you know, there's been uh, regulatory barriers that have prevented uh, sharing of the vaccines around the world. Uh, there have also been export restrictions in some cases that have caused further delays and 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 uh, problems with with shipping vaccines around the world. So there's 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 been a lot of those kinds of challenges. Um, we're also seeing in just in general a movement towards what I would call um, sort of localization or reshoring. Um, a lot of the uh, political agendas have started to move towards uh, thinking about sort of hoarding behaviors, uh, being able to, uh, you, you know, extreme nationalism just to talk about just having medicines for our country, uh, our country first. And, um, and and this is you know happening in the United States as well. I was on a Senate panel this week that, that they were really talking about reshoring of uh, of manufacturing and and bringing it back to the United States. So there's there's a lot of different forces at play here, but the number one, of course, is is uh, is the vaccines, the shortages of the vaccines. I think uh, in the United States we're, we're we're you know very well vaccinated here. We're making good progress. But in other parts of the world, you know, especially India, this week is in terrible shape. We need to uh, we need to make sure that we're distributing some of those vaccines much more quickly than we are today. Otherwise, 
we're going to continue to see these variants uh, continue to to grow and, and explode, which will in turn cause another cycle of new booster shots, new vaccine requirements, and uh, this cycle could could put us into a you know four to five year time window for be able being able to to really uh, address the, the the COVID crisis at the moment. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Rasmus. Hi and hi, Paula, and and good good to see you and and thank you for inviting me. And I I took part in a session earlier today, and I'll try not to. There was some overlap in the themes, so I'll try not to to repeat too much. But but I'll also say that I'm really excited about taking part in this session on data sharing. Um, I run a company that is a, a data uh, science analytics company, so we are we are deeply reliant on public available data and uh, and and visibility both upstream and downstream uh, in the in the supply chain to to help governments uh, organizations companies around the world make better decisions uh, related to, to covid so so this is a topic that's very close to my heart so just want to say that and in terms of some of the short term challenges I, I i think rob touched on some of the really important ones i would say two that on the short horizon comes up a lot in the conversations we are having um, with clients is the the variants uh, variants of concern that uh, of course it's it's no news that that, that those are also those are spreading but i think we are we are on a daily basis getting new uh, scientific results in on um both uh, how transmissible they are compared to the first strain um potential vaccine escape and i think uh, one important point that that we can see is that they have the variants have very different impact of vaccines so far uh, no variants has anywhere any anywhere close to full vaccine escape but there has been uh, some variants that have significant uh, reduced efficacy on some vaccines and that that is a challenge so for instance astrazeneca has shown to be lower against some of the uh, south africa the south african variant as as it calls and of course that creates a huge problem as 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 if if that variant starts spreading widely in africa as Africa is very reliant on uh, on the AstraZeneca, and indeed, what we've seen is that the South African government, as a result of that, went out and said we're not going to use the uh, AstraZeneca instead, trying to get the Johnson Johnson uh, vaccine. And I think we're going to see more and more of of that. And when we see this discrepancy in efficacy, then we are turning to a situation where ideally you would distribute vaccines after prevalence of of a, of a variant, and maybe something we can come back to because there's a there's a, a significant lack of data visibility on those variants and the prevalence in different countries. Um, and that, that brings me to the second challenge that, that, that I hear a lot, which is both related to booster shots, but, but also um, related to when are, when are these uh, companies going to make the shift over to a second generation of vaccines? Uh, because right now, a lot of the projections that are for global vaccine avail availability is basically assuming that we are continuing with this uh, with the existing uh, production. But the reality is it's very unlikely to be the case. What's much more likely is that several of the vaccine manufacturers starting in the fall, my bet would be September, October, would start saying, hey, now we're going to shift to a second uh, second generation. That means that we'll stop producing because that's the reality. You can't, there, is, there isn't an extra production facility to, to do second generation parallel with first generation. So they have to use the existing production facilities to make that shift, which means that they will in reality take vaccines out of the market. Um, and they, they're doing that partly for, for booster shots, but also for higher efficacy. So what's going to be the impact of that on global uh, glo global su supply of vaccines? I think that's a really, really important and, and un uh, unanswered uh, questions. question. However, uh, we are likely to see, no matter when that happens, we are likely to see some surplus doses. Um, and I think especially in Europe, we have an estimate of around 500 million surplus doses in Europe by the end of the year. So it's quite significant. We've seen some donation. Even today, I saw that the uh, EU uh, pledged 100 million, but that's still still not a lot. So what's going to happen with those su surplus doses going forward? What is the mechanism for sharing those? Um, are they going to be resold? You know, a country like Japan, for instance, has nowhere near enough supply, very low vaccination rates, et cetera. Should they be donated vaccines or should they buy? And, you know, there's a lot of complexity in, 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 in the surplus doses. 
Um, so those are those are some of the key short term challenges. Just very briefly, I think that the, the fundamental long term challenge uh, in a two to three to four year perspective that we need to come to terms with, and this repeat a bit from what session we had earlier today, but I just think it's really important. It is what is the total global demand we want? You know, what is the capacity of vaccine production we as as, as a global community needs? And you can look at that both from an um, individual demand perspective, how many people are we how many how likely are we how many doses you know assuming vaccine hesitancy and, and all of that but you could also take a different perspective and say from a risk perspective what is how much should we actually be spending what is the what is the cost of a pandemic versus the benefits of, of a high investment um, and i think if we look at it like that we would see we are still significantly under investing in in vaccine and you think you can make a strong compelling case that 100 to 200 billion a year continued going forward is uh, a good level of global capacity mm -hmm. for vaccines that can be quickly reconfigured. But I think without that long term visibility on the demand, it's hard to get vaccine uh, producers to continue to come into the, the area and also the whole sub supply to continue to invest in in scaling. So the long term demand is quite and, and short term supply. They are in uh, they're very linked. And I think that's sometimes overlooked. Thank you, Rasmus. Uh, Julie, also in our perspective, what are the, um, the greatest challenges that we are facing now? And you can already touch a, a, bit, a bit on uh, long term, what will be the challenges that uh, will come in the next six or even uh, to, to two years? I don't think we'll get out of this pandemic anytime soon. Julie? Thank you, Paula. Um, you know, there are several different areas where I see these challenges, and I'm going to focus especially on challenges that relate to data visibility, given the topic of, of the breakout. Um, so let me start with surveillance. Um, we know that testing has not shown us the true extent of the disease so far. Um, we really have no idea how many people have been impacted. It is much, much more than the, the publicly known numbers, um, both for cases and for deaths. It has a big implication moving forward because it does um, point to the demand for the vaccine, and it also has much longer uh, term implications as well. And in that space of surveillance and data, I think this genomic surveillance is also really important. And we only have right now a limited view of that with these initial variants of concern, you know, how widespread are they, uh, you know, to what extent are they already dominant in places around the world. So that's an area where I see that we need to continue focusing for the future. I'd love to get to the point where airports can uh, do surveillance through their wastewater and understand people coming in and out of a particular country, as well as a variety of other things in the surveillance uh, space. In terms of supply chain, there are a lot of challenges and, and several of these relate to data visibility. We don't really fully have a publicly known picture of the full supply chain, all the way to from the vaccine to all of the hundreds to thousands of components to the raw materials. And what we're finding is that the challenges are really not as much at the manufacturing level as they are much further back in that supply chain. And we continue to have challenges with some of the raw materials not only for the vaccines, but also for the ancillary products like syringes. And then as well, uh, there are challenges related to personal protective equipment and to uh, uh, diagnostic tests, treatments, oxygen supply, all of that. And with respect to some of those components, like we need to get it down to that raw material level where it is the plastics that are going into the syringe, the metals that are going into the needle, the tubing that's being used in the vaccine production process and in the treatment production process. And so we really need a coordinated global visibility of these different supply chains all the way down to those, uh, to the raw materials. And then to also think about the data visibility forward, are there other kinds of 
products that the shortages of raw materials are going to start impacting. But we know that there are a lot of other drugs for humans that use some of these same types of components, uh, components so that's really important. There are also a lot of products for animals that use some of these same types of components. So could these shortages, let's say related to tubing uh, for producing human vaccines, lead to potential shortages for producing animal vaccine? And right now we don't really have a good sense of that both within one product line as well as across multiple product lines. In terms of distribution, um, we have some, some general knowledge about uh, the kind of distribution going on, but when we start thinking about the connection between data and last mile, this gets really important, especially as we get more vaccine available for low and middle income countries. And we start thinking about both the, the first round of vaccination, the second round of vaccine for those where a second dose is required, and then booster shots later. So what level of data visibility are we going to have in terms of what vaccine an individual has already received and uh, potentially a second dose if needed? Uh, where are our gaps in terms of where we still need to vaccinate within a country, within a region? And then what are the implications for the longer term in terms of uh, the booster shots? So there are some of these different areas related to short and medium term challenges, especially ones that relate to data visibility. Thank you, Julie. Very interesting insights uh, so far about uh, what the issues are currently and moving forward, what it might uh, come across. So I heard the genomic uh, surveillance needs for better, for better surveillance. Um, better for long-term visibility of demand uh, and uh, end-to-end -end visibility of the supply chain as a whole for pandemic uh, and non-pandemic uh, products. So thinking of this, uh, so it, looking at the, the, the theme of the session, so there is a lot of data then that should be shared and it's not being shared for us to achieve uh, this end-to-end -end visibility, visibility of demand and better genomic surveillance. So in your opinion, what... Um, what data should have been shared that is not being shared? And how can we improve this situation moving, uh, moving forward? Uh, starting again with uh, Rob. Yeah, th thanks, Paula. <clears throat> now, this is a great question. Um, you, you know, I, I think what we need to show and, and uh, you know, some of the work that we've done in the electronic sector, you know, with companies like Flex show that you need to understand at a minimum, uh, you know, what is the uh, throughput capacity uh, of, uh, of of different manufacturers upstream in the supply chain in many of the areas uh, that we have. So first of all, there's something called a supply chain mapping is you have to map out your supply chain and understand who is in that supply chain. Um, and uh, Airfinity has, has done a great job of you know, pulling together some of that uh, initial data, but then really understanding uh, in more depth uh, what manufacturers, uh, not just tier one suppliers, but but Tier two suppliers, raw material suppliers, uh, and and what is the, uh, the the relative throughput capacity of these different manufacturers? Uh, it's also then important to understand uh, what is the the type of uh, the level of inventory that they have in terms of their stocks, the finished goods, uh, raw material stocks, uh, so you can begin to understand uh, where effectively are the bottlenecks, and and bottlenecks is is just that it's a it's a, it's a constraint for the end-to-end -end supply chain. And uh, ideally, you know, in a collaborative environment, we would have uh, all of the vaccine manufacturers sharing these, these supply chain maps and, and therefore would be able to collaborate and identify where these shortages are occurring and, you know, can we shift supply to different, uh, different parties. Well, that's that's a very theoretical ideal situation because we know for a fact that you know manufacturers don't like to share that information of who their key suppliers are. They're more likely to want to kind of hoard the material uh, for for their own their own supply chains and their own throughput and their own customers. Um, so so what we've we've proposed and we've we've put a, a proposal together to the International Commerce Commission and, and the WTO is that 
you know, we create maybe a high level visibility chart that would show, you know, not necessarily identifying who the different parties in the, are in this supply chain, but, uh, you know, what, what is their throughput? What is their capacity? What is their inventory? And, and so you would be able to identify where you are relative to others in the industry. But, but this type of intelligence we think would uh, benefit everybody and, and might spur some collaboration. I mean, there's been unheard of levels of collaboration between manufacturers up until now. It's, it's, it's been excellent, uh, you know, and, and we've seen this in a number of the, uh, you know, the Chatham House rules uh, sessions that have been held. But I think there's more that can be done. And, and I think the WTO would be the right. Um, uh, they've had some initial discussions around sharing that information, um, but there's still there's still reluctance, I think, on the part of a lot of manufacturers to share share that information. And, and I think having that visibility and having it updated in real time, again, you know, this is not an expensive technology, but to update it in real time and people can have almost a control tower view of what's what's happening in the supply chain. And you may not need to do it for all of these suppliers, but again, the, the critical suppliers where we see bottlenecks that are causing shortages from a supply perspective is important. Uh, and then I think the, the other upstream or downstream view that Julie spoke about, which is um, you know, where are the variants occurring? Uh, are there uh, congregate settings or hotspots that are, that are within certain countries, certain regions? Uh, for instance, we did a, an analysis looking at India, and not surprisingly, a lot of the vaccine hotspots are uh, unfortunately in the same areas where a lot of the vaccine manufacturing is going on. And so maybe those would be areas that we would want to target, you know, initially for distribution. So, so having better visibility into uh, areas where, where the vaccines are urgently needed, um, you know, to, to help support uh, and, and and address uh, these congregate settings where we're seeing these hotspots. Thanks a lot. That's that's a really interesting um, insight, uh, Rasmus. Uh, what's your take? Yeah, thank you. So, so I thought, um, yeah, Rob did some had some excellent points there, and I would also uh, concur that we have seen an unprecedented level of transparency across and collaboration already, and I think. Uh, industry associations, the industry as a whole, you know, Paolo, you and IFPMA have really helped push some of, uh, push some of this, which is quite, quite extraordinary. So we are quite far on the visibility, but I would say that uh, I don't want to repeat any, any points that Rob made. I agree, agree with all of it. We'll just point on one thing on the, if you look at the global supply chain, that there might be a bit of an issue that the largest manufacturers have the least of an incentive to share. Um, so if you look at at the biggest producers right now, I would, without knowing it and uh, in, in, in for certain, I would expect them to have fairly good understanding uh, one to two years ahead on, you know, the full supplies they would need to continue to scale uh, according to their, their their projected numbers and what and the manufacturing capacity they, they already had. The bigger problem is actually the longer tail. You know, we have you know 200 vaccine candidates. We have many newcomers, many biotech and smaller companies trying to come into that space. And they don't have the visibility that a that a Pfizer and you know maybe an AstraZeneca and, and and others have. So I think it's it's actually a little bit also from a kind of competitive perspective that it could be a strength to have some more kind of uh, visibility. And I don't think we can expect the. It's naive to expect the companies just to do all of that themselves. I think there is good pressure, and and I said the industry associations can can play a big role. But I think also national governments could link it up to some of these contracts and say. You know, we're paying the bill. Ultimately, you know, you need to to do some sharing as 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 part of that. I think um, one of the areas we're spending a lot of resources on trying to get right is production, and I I found it a little disappointing that that not more companies are willing to even just share. This week we produced this many vaccines. You know, so so some of those I would I think I don't see any competitive issues with sharing those. So so. I think there's still a bit more to, to be done. And then um, to the other point on uh, Julia's excellent point on, on uh, the variance and, and visibility on that, I, I couldn't agree more that this, if I should point at one problem, the biggest problem we have from a data perspective, that is lack of visibility on, on variance of concern. A lot of the data, I don't know if you know, but it comes through a centralized uh, database um, called GSAID. 
which is basically works the way that researchers around the world, they, they do their testing, then they upload this to the centralized database and then it makes uh, gets public. And you know, often some of that data can be uh, a month, two, three months even delayed. And there's, we, we don't, um, it's not a randomized controlled environment. So we know maybe the total number of a, a given genomic sequence in a country, but we don't know out of how many. So, you know, if someone, you know, just sent genomic sequencing of giraffes, you could come to the conclusion that's only giraffes having COVID in a given country, you know, to make it, you know, a bit of parody. But that, that's a reality. So, so the genomic sequencing is so, so far from what we need to be able to react. A country like uh, where I live, the UK is probably the front runner globally. And we've seen how the country is able to react much faster, localized lockdown, um, specific initiatives, because they have that genomic sequence ability. And I think we have to bear in mind here that the cost of genomic sequencing has dropped dramatically. It used to cost like 10,000 to do this. And now you can have these mobile devices for a few hundred. So we could, you know, we could give many, many more people uh, uh, these devices and then create a centralized uh, way to capture all of that. That would really be in everyone's interest. And I think GSI ID is made for research. I think we need a different type of entity for this and would be a relatively low cost intervention that would make a huge difference. Thank you, Rans. Actually, uh, yesterday evening, WHO announced a new hub for genomic uh, surveillance to hopefully have uh, um, a better surveillance network uh, in the world. So I think that some steps are being taken into um, that uh, direction. Uh, Julie, uh, what's your uh, take on what made, more data needs to be shared and is not being shared uh, now so we avoid the current situation? Yeah, so um, in, in thinking not just about COVID, but also what other pandemics may come next and both, you know, epidemics, major epidemics and worldwide pandemics, um, in, there are so many areas and we have made great strides. Uh, you know, our, my colleagues certainly pointed to that. As uh, Rob said, the, or, or perhaps Rasmus, the transparency that we've had so far on the pharmaceutical supply chains has been more than what we would normally have. And it is so tough because there are concerns around proprietary data and what that supply chain looks like. But that supply chain mapping of both the, the facilities, the locations, the capacity, the, the, you know, that regular ongoing throughput is so important and, and really even down to that raw material level since some of the shortages are being driven in that space. I think we've seen some improvements on the human vaccine uh, visibility for the, for the COVID vaccine. I think we need to see it across other products and across um, to be to more more complete, more sustainable. So as we think about these potentially cascading effects of the human COVID vaccine production, what might be its impact on flu vaccine production or on measles vaccine? Um, what is the trans transportation impacts on other products? I think that we need to have a better sense of all of those. Um, and, you know, starting with that supply chain mapping and, and then going, you know, in both directions, looking both at the current product and other products. Um, I, I like the focus on uh, surveillance that uh, Rasmus was, was discussing. And here, it's not just having more tests, you know, that is part of it, having the tests done and having that, that data shared, but it is also the speed of that information. I was looking at, at data on deaths yesterday, and we don't get good estimates on deaths for months uh, or, or sometimes more. And so we need to look at ways to both collect these different kinds of data, make them transparent and visible to the necessary stakeholders, and do some do that at a speed that makes sense. And the stakeholders here, it could be governments, uh, both current country and, and other countries and collaboration. It can also be researchers. We've seen lots of innovations coming out of uh, universities and companies and public-private partnerships. So the more that some of this data is made available, 
then the more minds can be, uh, brains can be uh, directed to it to solve problems. So ensuring uh, transparency and speed of data is really important. Uh, and then, you know, there, there are some technology challenges in, in doing some of these things. We've certainly seen the cost of genomic surveillance go down. That's a kind of surveillance where you, you do want capability in different places worldwide so that you can get that speed around that data. Uh, when we start thinking about the data on last mile distribution, again, there are different kinds of infrastructure um, systems that one needs to be thinking about and, uh, you know, ways to connecting with the, with the health clinics and the populations and thinking about how best to do that in a given country and then sharing that information up the supply chain. It's my hope that by doing that for COVID-19, that we'll also see improvement on surveillance of measles vaccines or other kinds of products where right now, when we run supplemental immunization activities in, so, in some of the lower income countries, some of the vaccines are given to, to children who are already protected because we don't have great systems for knowing who has protection and who doesn't have protection. We could also get better um, possibilities for that, that data surveillance and collection and sharing on the, the, the level of the antibodies to understand um, which children or, or others have protection for a particular uh, disease of interest. So those are some of the different areas. Uh, I would also invite you, Paula, to, to add to the conversation because you, with your experience, um, at, at the organization where you work, you also have some really important insights to offer. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Julie. I, I will try to, try to stay um, stay uh, uh, neutral, but I completely agree with uh, everything that has been said uh, so far. Uh, pharmaceutical companies have been trying to facilitate data sharing at uh, different uh, fronts, uh, and uh, it's not uh, an easy challenge. It's not an easy task, sorry, uh, because of uh, very often of legal requirements. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a straightforward as just to wanting to, to do, I'm thinking of regulatory requirements, uh, trying to facilitate data sharing, for instance, and sometimes it gets very, very tricky because of simply uh, country legislation, data privacy, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. Which brings me a bit to, the, to another question, like, which is whose responsibility is it to share data so we avoid the, the situation that we've been speaking so far? So we already in a way mentioned pharmaceutical companies and manufacturers sharing their inventory, demand, uh, and so on. Uh, countries that share a certain responsibility to share, for instance, their numbers of cases and so on. So that's something that we, it was also very um, not particularly well shared. Um, also to improve their capacity to do all the genomic surveillance and then share it uh, with the, the world. But uh, I would like to think to ask you if there are uh, any other actors and sectors that should be also sharing data that they are not uh, sharing. And how can this be done in a way that people are comfortable sharing? Because also, you know, manufacturers, sometimes they don't share and it's not because they don't want to. If there's proprietary concerns, anti-competitive um, uh, kind of thing. So this is tricky. It's the tricky or not only for us, for everyone. So who else should be sharing and how can we do it uh, in a way that uh, is done uh, in, a, in, a, in an uh, um, environment of uh, trust? I know this is very open-ended and tricky, but please let me know your, your thoughts on this. And this time I will start to with uh, Julie. <laughs> Right. Um, thank you for that. You named some of those uh, contributors, uh, the, the large pharmaceutical companies. Then you've got the, the contract manufacturers. Uh, you've got the, the suppliers of those raw uh, materials. We've got to have the countries participating in this. I'd like to see additional industry participating. So not just human health, but also animal health because there, there is some overlap and there is some overlap between vaccines and other kinds of things, COVID vaccine, other vaccine, oncology treatments, you know, certainly other, other elements. I think that we need some international organizations uh, participating. Uh, so I think that's really important. 
I think that, we, and you know, we've also seen that crowdsourcing uh, is another potential source of data, as well as information that's made publicly available. I know Airfinity has, has done some work on this. And, you know, there is a lot of information that is publicly available, but it's in disparate locations. And so, uh, you know, ways to bring all of that data together and make sure that the, the right uh, kinds of people or organizations have access to it is really important important. I would also say that we have lots and lots of ways that we can address privacy or confidentiality concerns. There are algorithms, there are databases, you know, computer scientists have been working on this problem. We do this every day with personal health information and other kinds of things. We've seen it in other industries. You know, we've certainly seen these kinds of concerns from semiconductor industries or, or perhaps from others where they're concerned about the, the design or the proprietary aspects. I hope that COVID-19 has been um, one push forward for showing that more data can be shared in this pharmaceutical space and that it doesn't necessarily lead to uh, you know, revenue losses for those companies. So there are many different ways that we can address these things. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Rasmus? Yeah, just a few points. I think from a regulatory side, it is possible to drive a lot of this transparency even further. I think it, it is very true that the, in, the life science industry, compared to any other industries, is among the most transparent at all, but but take take areas, for instance, as, as clinical trials. We have an amazing database in clinicaltrials.gov that I think the whole world actually relies on. And there's a lot of public investment going into that from the US, which I think is greatly benefiting actually the, the, the whole world. But more could be done in a, in an area like like that. For instance, you could you could require more to to upload. You could also do be more proactive. We found that there are quite a lot of important trials that are not available in, in, in those databases. So I think a, a further investment and and requirement it could 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 make um, you know push the industry even okay. even further. And then I would say there's also um, there are new new tools. So part of the problem is, as um, as as you pointed out, Bob, um, is that we um, many companies simply can't you know, even if they wanted to, they are not allowed to 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 share those data. And especially if you're publicly traded, it it creates a whole set of set of problems but what what we have seen in other industry is um, anonymizing the data uh, by if third if we have third party independent third party that anonymize some of that data it actually enables a company to share so for instance on the production so a company might not want to say i had these and these production challenges but if everyone shared and you can't point at oh it was this company that had the production challenges then everyone wins you get a, like an, a better better overview but it, it requires a, a trusted third party and and uh, an anonymization of these uh, these data points but i think with some of these for instance blockchain and other new technologies there is actually a lot of potential to 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 overcome some of those uh, challenges so i think it's a, it's a really exciting new new frontier for the industry Thanks a lot, uh, Rans. I know uh, we'll ask um, Robert how he sees this data could be shared, and particularly in the in in terms of the visibility of demand of the uh, supply chain that uh, he mentioned uh, earlier. Robert. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so I think there's there's several areas where I think we could we could really uh, focus on uh, improving the uh, the visibility and. I'd like to echo, uh, you know, on the regulatory side, um, you know, I think I think what we're seeing today is is that uh, there is a lot of new capacity coming online. Um, I've I've had some interviews with people in uh, single use technologies, you know, which is a a technology where you know essentially for a vaccine manufacturer, the the entire thing is constructed out of plastic rather than having you know stainless steel tanks. You know, you go in. It's a it's a it's a one one stop shop. You go in and you set up your your production facility, and it's a it's a single use. It's a single use technology, and I think there's uh, some interesting uh, new developments there that could rapidly scale up uh, the production of of some of these things. But I think that's also going to require um, you know collaboration between different countries on the regulatory side. And it would be really good if if some of the regulatory agencies could collaborate 
uh, globally to come up with, uh, you know, greater standards around requirements for this, you know, between, you know, between the EU and, and the US and Canada and, and Asia, uh, it, you know, it's going to be important. And there are some there are some significant challenges in terms of, um, you know, some countries, it's, it's just very difficult to get any kind of uh, collaboration from the uh, regulatory uh, agencies to, to 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 work across across boundaries across countries, so the sharing of those requirements and standards is going to be important, and that will help us scale up capacity as well. Um, I, I think it will also be important, uh, you know, to not only capture data on where these hotspots are, but to be able to rapidly, uh, you know, share that information in a in a format that can be used by the uh, you know by government agencies uh distributors and 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 pharmaceutical manufacturers um you know i know we've talked about the issue of of expiration expirating uh vaccines and uh you know some some uh some countries have said you know well we have these these vaccines they're expiring you know let's donate them well where's the best place to donate them where can they be the most effective given uh, given the expiration date on those materials, you know where can we ship them rapidly to different regions and, and in, a, in a in a fashion that will they can be the most effective before they expire. And then I, I think we also will have to have um, additional discussions around uh, anti counterfeiting between uh, different agencies. There are some there is some counterfeiting activity that's going on right now it's likely to escalate. I predict it's going to go up a lot in the next year. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of that is coming out of uh, China and Hong Kong. So there's going to be some some uh, so, some needs for really strong uh, regulatory agencies to also start to coordinate you know, through Interpol or other agencies to to crack down on on these counterfeit vaccines that may be going out as well. So those are some other areas that I think might be relevant to uh, think about in terms of data sharing and visibility. Thanks a lot, uh, Rob. And interesting that you mentioned uh, anti counterfeiting but uh, because it, historically has never been a big issue for vaccines, and with, with the pandemic is becoming quite uh, quite big, and, and we are kind of struggling to know how to um, how to manage it. Um, we are coming to an end, and uh, we have a question on the Q and A. So. How should uh, one switch, switch from current vaccine formulations to next generation formulations for variants be managed, uh, managed in order to optimize supply and to ensure that countries have the vaccines best suited for their populations? What data will we need? How should decisions be made? I don't know if uh, any of you wants to take uh, this, uh, this question on. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with it and, and then my colleagues can jump Thanks, in. Sorry. You know, it, it's worth looking at what we do for influenza, where we have different strains that circulate, uh, and over time this changes. There is an international convening body uh, through the World Health Organization that looks at the data on mutations and strains and helps determine what strains are most likely to be um, of impact in that next season. And, you know, there are some pluses and minuses of, of that kind of system, but it is a coordinated um, consideration of that. And so I think that that is really important. I think another thing to take from influenza is that sometimes you can include more than one strain in, in a given vaccine. So you may have a trivalent or even a, a quadrivalent that covers uh, and provides protection against more than one strain of a disease. And if so, then that is something where the switch from one uh, type of, of variant to another may not necessarily be a hard switch that will have as much impact on production. And so, you know, that's really important as we think about satisfying the demand throughout the world and across low and middle income countries, while also starting to think about those booster shots for populations that have gotten um, one vaccine uh, already or vaccine to protect against a particular strain. I'll now turn to my colleagues. I'm I'm happy to to jump in with a comment and uh, you know 
Julie encouraged me to disagree with uh, with, with fellow panelists, so I'll, I'll try to do that <laughs> to spice things up a, a, a bit. And I think it's, in, by the way, it's an incredibly interesting question. So thank you so much for whoever asked that. Um, I think part of the in in the way it's done in flu um, is basically you take all the strains together and you create you kind of agree on a common standard and then all the vaccines kind of work towards that. The problem with that is that it's reducing efficacy quite a lot. And there's the reasons for it, you also do it in flu. You know, flu have many more mutations than, than coronavirus, right? It's a coronavirus is a much slower mutating, uh, mutating uh, virus. So, and, and flu, of course, we know that we have these 50 to 60% efficacy rate. What we're looking at, at, at COVID is up to 90, 95. And, you know, I cannot stress how important it is that we, we stay above the at least 80, because otherwise there is, there is a huge risk of localized pandemics and, and other other things so and and given also what i mentioned before that we are seeing that specific strains are working against certain vaccines um i don't think the solution is this kind of common we put all strains into one and then just let all vaccine do second generation against a commonly agreed kind of meta strain or whatever we could call it i i think actually a more promising avenue especially with the mrna is that that we develop uh, we develop vaccines against specific mutations. We also know that theoretically there are many uh, incredible scientists around the world that are uh, starting to work on theoretical mutations or likely mutations that we're seeing given a certain number of infections. So you can start to predict though some of those things. And I think that that's actually more the future. It will be quite a complicated setup, right? Because we need some regions with some vac variants. And of course, variants are a multivariant in, in some areas. But, but I think it is, it is, it could, should be the long term goal because keeping the, the effectiveness of these vaccines really, really high is completely fundamental to, to, to solving uh, and preventing uh, many deaths, as we've seen, sadly seen this year. Rob, any final comments? No, I, I think this is, these are both really excellent comments from, from the other panelists. Um, you know, and the only thing I would add is I think it, you know, the, the idea of predicting, um, predicting future variants, I think is, is excellent. And, um, you know, I, I think the mRNA vaccine is, as, as, as uh, Rasmus pointed out, is, is the one that really is the easiest to modify. And so we, if we can give some thought as to, um, you know, how, how to start to scale up, um, you know, uh, future variants uh, or, or vaccines for specific variants and, um, and, and start to, uh, to lay out some of these possible technologies that could produce these rapidly and scale up rapidly, uh, I think is going to be important as well. So I, I don't have a lot to add, but I think that that's, uh, the, the, this is really an interesting question that, that I think, you know, I'd like to think about further, actually. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And if I may weigh in, as it's the, the last uh, question, as uh, I've worked quite a lot to with the influenza preparing for the next uh, pandemic of influenza, I think it's very important that there is a coordination on managing this uh, switch to transition from, to, for new, for instance, if we need to manufacture for a new variant, to have a very clear signal and alignment on who does what based on epidemiology. Because if you leave that for to individual manufacturers, this will be quite uh, chaotic and add an extra layer of complexity to supply chain um, supply chain challenges because the, it will depend on the epidemiology on the needs. It's far more complicated than that for uh, SARS-CoV-2, but uh, I think that international coordination and a clear signal is um, it, 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 it will be quite um, important. Um, so I think that we're, we have come to, to an end to our session. Uh, I will just, uh, before wrapping up, ask each of you for uh, a kind of a 30 second uh, wish, uh, one, the one and, old, uh, one and uh, only thing that you think will need to be in place so that you would like to really see to address uh, this uh, uh, pandemic. They are, the, what you have one thing to choose uh, that we would like to see implemented in the next uh, few weeks that will help address the current uh, data awareness uh, supply chain uh, challenges. So, um, Rob, your wish? Yeah, my wish, I think, is, that, is if we could have a, you know, more of a centralized third party uh, organization, maybe it's the WTO, the ICC, or, or uh, you know, maybe a, 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 a consortium of companies come together 
and create some type of a visibility system that allows us to look upstream uh, where I think the constraints are occurring. Um, another wish would be to be able to identify uh, current investments. We, we know that there's going to be uh, a lot of, of uh, capacity coming online in Q4 and Q1 in some of these upstream supplies. It'd be nice to see where those facilities are, are being constructed, uh, how much capacity we expect, uh, you know, the regulatory timelines around that, and almost build out a, a, a view to, to what we can expect in the next year or two in terms of current capacity, future capacity, and, and likelihood of uh, other bottlenecks that might arise, and to do this in a collaborative fashion. Thanks a lot. That's a, that's a great uh, wish. Uh, Rasmus? Yeah, I would just say that given that this is an American event, I would, I would, my my wish would be that um, America continues to be the the pioneer and the leader in transparency. I think they have done. Uh, the country has is probably the most transparent when it comes to anything life science and, and medical. And I would hope it would continue to to do that. It could do it in production in the variance areas and, and in many others. And also because I think if America takes the lead on this, it'll push other nations, especially China. We haven't discussed China a lot, but it's actually one of the, from a data perspective, probably the biggest challenge. It's the biggest producer in the world at the moment of vac vaccines. And we have little, little full transparency over that. And I think um, pressure on uh, on China to 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 share more data in in this space is is critical. I mean, there are many countries around the world that rely on vaccines from China that we don't fully know the efficacy of, and this this is something that greatly concerns me. And I I think uh, I hope and I hope the Biden administration will continue to push a transparency agenda in in this space. Uh, thank you, uh, Ravan. That's a very important uh, point to consider. Julie, your wish. So I, I want Rob's system. Uh, I think we should absolutely have that and not just for human COVID-19 vaccines, but across other products as well uh, to really understand both, both um, upstream and downstream and cascading effects. And then I would just add that I want continued better and faster data on the surveillance side and the last mile distribution. Thanks, thanks a lot, Julie. So I think that's it uh, for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rob, Julie and Rasmus for your contribution uh, today. This was really, really insightful. Uh, thank you also for the audience uh, for um, for attending this panel. Uh, and um, I, I think that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, see you at the next uh, workshop on the 25th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.